All right. We're talking about the Bible. God talk. We're talking about foundational things of the Christian life. Things that you, you just, you got to get a hold of these things. And we're living in a world where there's so many, there's so much divergence, so, so many different ideas about God and about what's true and what's false and what is, what honors God and what dishonors God. And we just want to lay some foundational things down during this series that will run through the summer. But if we're going to lay a foundation, we're going to have to start with God's Word. And this is the one spot where everything else really is going to rise and fall on your view of Scripture, your view of the Bible. And so we're going to spend some time on that today. The Word, I, uh, I really believe this book's true. I mean, cover to cover. And uh, someone caught me after the first service, and they said, one of their favorite quotes about the Bible, they said, I believe the Bible's true from Genesis 1-1 right on through the maps at the back. And that's, that's pretty good. Uh, uh, I heard a, uh, one pastor, he, he said, this is Adrian Rogers. He said, I believe it from cover to cover. In fact, when it says genuine leather, I believe that too. So this is the Bible. It is the Word of God. Uh, the word Bible comes from a Greek word that means book. And so when it says Holy Bible, it is a holy, a holy book. The Bible is actually not just one book. It contains 66 separate books. 66 separate books. 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New Testament. It's written in three languages. Hebrew, most of the Old Testament Hebrew. Greek, and then a smattering of Aramaic phrases. It's also written over a period of somewhere around 1,500 years by somewhere over 40 different authors on three different continents, uh, Europe, Africa, and Asia. The amazing thing about those 66 books accumulated, oh, written down, a lot of them existed in oral history long before, written down over that somewhere over 1,500 years is the amazing unity among these books that a unity of message and a unity of focus. The scriptures cover so much territory, but chief among those focuses from, from Genesis to the end, it is the revelation, the making known, the revealing of the person and the work of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. And this book is written by people, different ages, from different cultures, they include kings and peasants, philosophers and fishermen, poets, statesmen, scholars. The books in the Bible cover history, sermons. Some are personal letters. Some are, are songs. Some are love letters. There are geographical surveys. There are architectural specifications. There are travel diaries population statistics, family trees, inventories, and numerous legal documents. It covers controversial topics with amazing unity from beginning again to the end. It's the best-selling book of all time, translated now into somewhere uh, almost 3,000 different languages. And this book, and this is how we, when we talk about the Bible at our church, this is how we talk about it. We talk about the Bible as the Word of God. God is the author of this book. And, and, and down to the very words of the book. Now, God inspired writers through history to record His Word. And they do that through the lens of their life, their culture, their perspective, using their style, their voice. And yet God uniquely inspired those writers to record everything he wanted us to know about life, about time, about eternity, about him, about us, and about how we can have a right relationship with him with complete accuracy. So it's no surprise that when, when I make a declaration like that, this is the word of God, that, that people who are... Bible-believing Christ followers, which is the phrase I'm using more often than Christian because Christian is so vague a term now. It has become meaningless in our own culture because people, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian. And back to your Princess Bride thing, you know, I don't think that word means what you think it means. 
A Christian is a very defined thing in Scripture. It's not anything you want it to be. And so, there's a difference between how Bible-believing Christ follower Christians are going to approach the Bible and how especially non-Christians are going to approach the Bible. I believe it is trustworthy, it's true, and I don't do that blindly. I do that because I've investigated it thoroughly, because I dug in deep. I, mean, I had my faith rocked as a college student by an atheist professor that caused me to dive down at a whole new level to say, is this trustworthy? Is this true? Can I rely on this book? And I found it stood up to the test. And the people who are non-Christians who say, oh, well, you know, the Bible's been proven to be false. The Bible's proven to be uh, fairy tales. The Bible's proven to be full of errors. They have no evidence for that. They just read it on Facebook. And like a lot of things on Facebook, it's crazy talk. So when you look at the evidence, when someone actually looks at the evidence, you find the Bible to be thoroughly reliable in all that it speaks to, all that it says, all that it addresses. But there is a challenge here for people who aren't believers because here's how Paul, the Apostle Paul talked about it. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. They're folly to him. He's not able to understand them because they're spiritually discerned. There, there is a, a point where you have to be willing to open your mind to the possibility God's God and you're not in order to hear from God. And a lot of people aren't quite at that spot. Now, among those who call themselves Christians... In, in our, we'll, just, we'll just do our country. There are a lot of perspectives on the authority of the Bible. We talk about this is the Bible, the authoritative word of God. Well, that means different things to different people. And I came across an article a while back. And it was really helpful to me. And said, oh, yeah, okay, that, that's a good way to summarize the authority of the Bible as different groups see the authority of the Bible. And so I want to run through this quickly. And this is not anywhere in your notes stuff, but you, you probably ought to write these three things down. Here's the first one. There are people who relate to the Bible as a fixed anchor. And that means it is an anchor. It is authoritative in their life. Uh, the absolute authority for truth. Among these folks, if you have a Bible verse, you're probably going to win an argument with them. Because they're going to say, I believe the Bible's true. And if the Bible says that, I believe it. So... Their definition of biblical authority, it's simple. Uh, succinct enough, you can put it on a coffee cup. Uh, when, the, when the Bible speaks, God speaks. And when, when I'm talking about the Bible, and when I'm going through my life with the Bible, how I want to lead our church always is when the Bible speaks, God speaks. And it is an authoritative word from God. So that's how we're going to attack that around here. When... When the fixed anchor folks study the scriptures, they want to discover, okay, what was the author's original intention and what is the contemporary application? Uh, sometimes you have heard that phrase said is, what is the Bible? What did the Bible mean? What it, what it meant to him and what it means to us. And you want to bridge that gap well because there are things. So here's how when we talk about Bible study, we say biblical languages are important in understanding what it meant. Cultural things, during the time it was written, that's important to what it meant. A historical background, comparative analysis of how does it relate to the other books in the Bible, all those things. When we study the Bible in our context as fixed anchor folk, we're going to look at all those things. And as you study God's Word, one of the things that happens, and I expect this at this stage in my life as I expected it when I was much, much younger, now, I've been studying the Bible for a long time, but I expect that I'm going to learn new things, and I'm going to see new things, and God's going to speak to me in new ways. But here's the thing about the fixed anchor people. When, when there comes time for a change in how they see what the Bible says, it's going to be in the direction of believing what the Bible says more strongly than what the culture ever said. There are a lot of people who say, well, when I change, I'll change toward the culture. For the fixed anchor folks, I'm going to lean toward what the Bible says. Now, culture changes. God's word does not change, say the fixed anchor people. Are you with me out there? You get that one? This is a huge divider. When all the people out there, all the churches that are out there who say we are Christian, these things define them all. They're fixed anchor people. And then there's also another category of people. There are 
they're sea anchor people. Now, here's what that means. Some of you are familiar. You are ocean-going people, and you're familiar with a sea anchor. Here's how the dictionary defines that. A sea anchor is a device used to stabilize a boat in heavy weather. Rather than tethering the boat to the seabed, the sea anchor increases the drag through the water and thus acts as a brake. It's a stabilizer, but it doesn't anchor like the fixed anchor people. Here we go. This group views Scripture as providing an invaluable guide, uh, caution, ballast against changing, a changing culture that may be changing too rapidly. So I just want to slow that down, want to temper it just a bit. But this group, as they look at cultural change and the Word of God, they're going to say more often, well, I know the Bible says that, but my, you know, my feelings, my experience, uh, my opinion may diverge some from this. And they're all good with that. That, well, God's, I don't know, my relationship to God makes me think that maybe that isn't really so anymore. That God probably, maybe God used to believe that, but God doesn't believe that anymore. This is the sea anchor group. i give you an example of how this can work. In uh, 2000, we have this uh, doctrinal statement. It's not everything about everything, but it's a, it's a pretty good umbrella of these are the things that generally we're going to believe as a Baptist church that believes the Bible. It's called the Baptist Faith and Message. In 1963, there was a big revision of one that had come from 1925. 1963 version added some things because there were issues that needed to be addressed. The 63 version is what I grew up with. In 2000, there was a big controversy in Baptist life about changing the Baptist faith and message. And one of the core places, and by the way, I came through college and seminary during one of the most heated denominational battles uh, ever in Southern Baptist life. And we're fighting largely over the, what the Bible says. And in the section on the Bible, in the 63 version, on the authority of the Bible, there was a sentence. And this is what the sentence said. It concluded that section this way. The criterion by which the Bible is to be interpreted is Jesus Christ. When that was included in the 1963 version, I understand exactly why they did it. And it has great meaning for me. But the 2000 version took that out. And that's why we adopted the 2000 version when it came out at our church. One of several reasons. Because it closed the loop of false teaching. Because see, I was in class with Baptist professors that our money that goes from here to our Baptist institution was paying for that said, well, I believe the Bible is the word of God, but the Jesus I believe in, because the criterion by which the Bible is to be interpreted is Jesus Christ, the Jesus I believe in, I just don't think that he would think that's wrong anymore. The Jesus I believe in would say something different than what this book says. And I sat in classes with professors like that. And you know what? It made me determine I'm going to be a different guy than that. My foundation, my authority is going to be the Word of God, not some idiot's opinion about it. And I was more than glad to kick some of them to the curb when we started cleaning some heresy out of our denomination because we were headed down the same route as mainline Christian denominations all over our country that have abandoned the Word of God. I got no patience with that. That was one place where it showed up for me in a dramatic way. The authority of the Scriptures as written was played off against the authority of Scripture as heard, as received, as interpreted, as how I feel about it. When folks from this group study the Bible, they tend to look for a trajectory, a pattern, a priority. They, they have certain defeater verses, and we have seen these used quite creatively in the last couple of years in our country. By those who say, oh, I believe the Bible, but, you know, there's that verse, like Galatians 3.28, that says, it's a great verse, that says, there is neither 
Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ. And they take that verse and say, well, yeah, there are verses in the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, that say same-sex same marriage is probably not going to be God's plan. That says that our sexual identity, the definition of marriage, is founded on the Word of God. But they say, but, you know, there's, there's, there's that verse, that Galatians 3.28. And that Galatians 3.28, it, it just nullifies. It's a, it, it, it counts those other verses out. And they lean into those kind of verses to make the Bible say whatever they wanted to say, or at least to selectively trim things out of it. So you develop a biblical canon. What is the Bible that we develop a canon within the canon? And folks start living comfortably with a personally edited Bible that fits them. Not that, I, I believe the Bible, but not that part, not that page, not that book, not that section. And they edit things out of it. Now, Group three, those who relate to the Scripture as a historical and cultural landmark. A historical and cultural landmark. Now, these folks tend to speak of Scripture as uh, one of the quotes I found, an important partner in the dialogue. Like the works of Shakespeare are important for a culturally relevant person. Well, the, uh, the Bible falls into that category as well. So there's a lot of freedom of interpretation with this group. Uh, they, they respect the Bible as a useful landmark, but they don't feel constrained by it or governed by it in any way. The hearer is ultimately authoritative over the written text. So you can say, the Bible says, and they say, well, yeah, but Gandhi says, and uh, Jimmy Fallon says, they're, they're all in equal standing. Whatever you believe and whatever you want to follow, whatever you want to quote, well, they're all in the same line, co-equal with one another. They, they'll read the Bible for a thought for the day, for a little inspiration here and there, but they're not expecting to receive authoritative instruction. A change in the historical cultural landmark group, if it's going to be a change, it's always going to lean toward the culture. So, well, everybody in culture says this is okay now. And they'll say, well, that's probably the way that we should go. And we'll push the Bible aside wherever it is in conflict with the direction the culture's going. And there are plenty of folks who are doing that. Now, an example, a former megachurch pastor, Rob Bell. Uh, he's, he's still out there, still in the news, still writing books. And uh, a lot of us uh, kept up with him from early on in his ministry. But Rob Bell recently said this. And he was referring to the ongoing uh, gay, marriage dis uh, gay marriage discussion. He said... I think culture is already there with gay marriage, and the church will continue to be even more irrelevant when it quotes letters from 2,000 years ago as their best defense. Okay, now here's what I'll say to that. Christians are most relevant when they quote the Word of God because its words are God's words, and these words have the power to rescue lost sinners from their sin to establish a living relationship with the living God and can give the hope and promise of eternal life in heaven. This is the word of God and we are most relevant when we quote this book. Always. I want to share this. Now, I hope you're following along with many of you involved in our church-wide Bible reading plan. You may be reading other things in addition to this, but uh, this, this week we're reading 2 Timothy. Tomorrow's Bible reading is 2 Timothy chapter 3. And as my gift to you on this last Sunday of June, I'm going to read half the chapter to you today. You only have to read half of 2 Timothy 3 tomorrow now to save you some time because I care about you. We're going to pick up in verse 10. The first, the first half of chapter 3, it's a laundry list of everything that's wrong in a sinful world. Just all the things that are broken. All, all, the, all the, 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 what sin does and, and the devastation it causes. And then... It's like turning over the coin. Paul, here's the other side of the story. You, however, verse 10 of 2 Timothy 3, you, however, in contrast to that broken, sinful world, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions, and sufferings that happened to me in Antioch, and Iconium, at Lystra, which persecutions I endured. Yet from them all, the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who desire 
to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. That's one of those uh, tough verses. Are you being persecuted for your faith in any way? Are you paying any kind of price for being a Christian? Well, according to Paul, I can tell you why. Because you're not living a godly life. How does that feel? While evil people and imposters will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is breathed out by God, inspired, God-breathed, profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Bible-believing followers of Jesus Christ begin with the assumption that God has made himself known. He has revealed himself. He's not a secret hiding away somewhere. He wants us to know him. He wants us to love him. He wants us to have a relationship with him. So that, that word revealed, if you're, gonna, if you're going to buy a good book on Christian theology, the first chapter in that book most all the time is going to be on Revelation. Not Revelation, the last book in the Bible, but Revelation, God making himself known. that the, the core of the nature of God, he wants us to know him. So God has chosen to unveil himself to us, invite us to explore him, to understand him, to understand his intentions for how we are to live, how we're to live in relationship to other people, how we're to live in relationship to him. And the full revelation of him is found in this book. His clearest revelation is through Jesus Christ. How do we know Jesus Christ? Through this book. God himself is speaking to humanity through this book so that we can be real, genuine knowers of God. Not God as a concept, not God as a theological idea, but God in relationship. He tells us this is how life works. This is how life is to be lived. And God has authority because he is the author of life. Now, in this passage in 2 Timothy 3, there's some things that are said in verse 16, verse 17, that help us to understand this is God's purpose for this book. This is how this book is, is developed, used, applied by us. And one of the things we're going to find uh, is that uh, we're made to live for something a lot bigger than ourselves. So here we go. Four things. In, that, in those verses, 16 and 17, the Bible teaches us. The Bible teaches us. It teaches us about God. It teaches us about ourselves. It teaches us about the world around us. It teaches us about how to have faith in Jesus Christ and a relationship to Him. It teaches us what God demands from us, expects from us. And this is one where we do not self-identify. We, we're, in a, we're in a culture where everyone self-identifies. I'm a Christian. We identify with sexual identity. Whatever sexual identity I choose on the day, our culture says, that's, that's the way that works. We self-identify on all sorts of stuff. And Christians have been doing this for a lot longer than people have been doing it with sexual identity. Because Christians have said, well, I'm a Christian, but this is how I do it. And it may not have much to do with this at all. Uh, the self-identity thing, we hear it often in phrases like, you know, I don't have to go to church to be a faithful, godly Christian. And people say, oh, yeah, I've heard that before. That must be true because I read it on Facebook. Well, you know what? That's false teaching because the Bible says, no, you do have to have a committed relationship to a local church family to live in right relationship to God because that's how God designed the Christian life to be lived in community with other people where spiritual gifts are accumulated in such a way as God forms the church to accomplish everything he intends for that church. You can't live a godly Christian life apart from a committed relationship to a local church. So... We're self-identifying, defining Christianity to be whatever we want it to be, defining relationship to God to be whatever we want it to be, instead of saying, this is, there, there's an authority on this. There's a way this works and a way it does not work. And God's Word makes all those things quite clear to us. He teaches us the only way to understand who you are and what you're given life and breath to do is to look at life and everything around you 
through the lens of God's word. It's only here that you learn you were made by God and for God. Everything you have, everything you are, everything about your life is for him. Think about this. This Bible teaches us this is the reason that God uh, created Adam and Eve and he immediately started talking to them. Because he knew they didn't have any innate ability to figure this out on their own. They didn't know what to do. He started talking to them. He spent time with them. He communicated to them what they needed to know. And in the same way, he has given us his word for the same reason. Because we're not going to know him. We're not going to understand him. We're not going to fulfill his expectations for our life until he tells us and his word tells us. Second, the Bible tells us what's wrong with our lives. The biblical word uh, that we, we have, in my translation, reproof. It means, it tells, it tells us, okay, here's how you're supposed to treat other people. It calls out the things we do when we think we're getting away with something and we're really not. It talks about how we treat God, how we respond to God. The Bible tells all those things. Reproof. It says, this is where you're missing it. This is where you're getting it wrong. This is one of the biggest reasons for the word of God. Because without this... We would not know how dire our situation is, how desperate our situation is because of our sin. You know why? Because sinners, we always overestimate our goodness and underestimate our sinfulness. How sinful are you? Well, I'm not too bad. I look up and down the aisles, uh, look up and down the aisles here and look across people sitting on the pew with me. I'm a lot better than most of these people, right? Amen? Aren't you better than most people in your pew? Yeah, you probably are. There's some rough characters in the building today. Yeah. We compare ourselves with other people instead of comparing ourselves with the standard of holiness that God's word declares. And, and that, that's going to lead us down some paths that are not healthy paths. So the Bible, without the Bible, we would not know that our biggest problem does not exist outside of us. So much of how we think in our culture about where our problems come from, uh, a, a lot of... Uh, Modern psychology is based on my problems are because, uh, you know, what, ask someone, what's the biggest problem in your life? Well, I'll tell you the biggest problem in my life. My wife, my husband, my kids, my parents, that guy I work for, those people that work for me. Those are the biggest problems in my life. And we'll point everywhere outside of us. The Bible says our biggest problem is inside of us, and that problem is called sin. And it makes a mess of everything. And the, without the Bible, we would always be pointing outside. The biblical story is the world's most accurate diagnostic because it tells us what's really wrong with us. But the great part about that diagnostic is that God doesn't just say, here's what's wrong, but he says, here's how to get it right. Here's how to fix this problem. And so that's why we get the story of Jesus. God sent his own son to die on a cross to pay for our sin so that our biggest problem, we could be set free. We could have a relationship to God and eternal life in heaven one day in God's timetable of things. That this biblical story of the cross of Christ, we are delivered. And the one thing we desperately need that we cannot do for ourselves, this new life in Christ, God has made a way. Uh, I was talking to the first hour about uh, I'm just over a month now from uh, having had shingles. You know, I thought, oh man, I don't know what's wrong with me, but it's never been wrong with me like this before. And I self-diagnosed myself first. I went to my doctor and said, hey, I think I got shingles. He said, you have you broken out? I said, no. It's all on my left side, and I'm pretty sure I got shingles. If I didn't go to my doctor every time I go to him and say, I've self-diagnosed myself. If every conversation didn't start that way, he would take me much more seriously probably. But I told him that. WebMD says, you know, doctors love it when you do that. Uh, he sent me home with some other medications. Oh, you've dinged something in your back. You've got some nerve inflammation. And then I broke out. It's one of the greatest days of my life because I got to say, I told you so to my doctor. So I took full advantage of that opportunity. Uh, he, of course, fell down on his knees and wept in repentance for not believing me in the first place. He just called in a prescription. That's all he did. But he acknowledged I did have shingles. But he didn't just leave me hanging like, okay, good luck with that, man. He gave me medication that turned that around pretty quick, that, that met the need that I had. And this is what the Bible does. God doesn't just say, hey, here's where you messed up. God comes up with the only solution to make it all right. The Bible tells us then what's right. 
uh, the biblical word here is correction. You know, after we've been made aware that you know, he teaches us, he makes us aware, here's where you messed up, here's where you rebelled, here's where you're on the wrong track, here's where you're going the wrong direction. Then we find in this book, the Bible, the path to help us recover. Once you have this conviction of the Holy Spirit, here's the sin in my life, then we turn our lives in repentance and faith and commitment to Jesus Christ as our one and only Savior. And the Bible says, okay, now your sin's been forgiven. You have a relationship to God. You're going to go to heaven when you die. Here's the path. Here's the path between here and wherever you're, you're headed between here and eternity. Here's the path. You stay on this path. Here's, here's what's right. Here's what God expects from you. Correction puts us on the right path. Uh, the, the word correction in other places in Greek literature, it shows up translated as straighten up. Correction is straighten up. Did your parents ever tell you that when you were growing up? I got that every once in a while. You sit in the back seat on a long road trip uh, fighting with my sister. Mom, dad, we learned, you can't straighten up in that back seat. Man, you did. Real quick. They weren't above stopping a car. Uh, wailing away on us so uh when they said straighten up i mean stop doing what you're doing start doing what's right well the bible does the same thing here's what's right here's how to here's how to get this walk with me right the bible not only reproves us it corrects us and that's important because god not only points out our sin he also shows you the way to righteousness Here's what right relationship with God looks like. Here's what right relationship with other people looks like. And the Bible is filled with those messages. The Bible isn't this big negative book about don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. The Bible is a book but it says this is how you should live. It's a positive book. It says I'm not leaving you hanging trying to guess what this life is supposed to look like. It is profitable for correction. Get you on the right track and you walk with Jesus through life. The fourth thing. The Bible shapes us into the person God intends. The biblical word here we're working with is training in righteousness. How to live in right relationship with God, right relationship with other people. Uh, the, uh, the, the last thing we said, the correction is to get us back on track. Training in righteousness is how to stay on the track. How to continue to be faithful in living that life. So it shapes us into the husband, the wife that God intended for us, created us to be. That's why, so Jimmy Smith and I in this family series, we had multiple sermons on various aspects of marriage in, this, in the long family series, three months. And the great thing, we could just say, here's what the Bible says. Here's what the Bible says. Here's what the Bible says. Because the Bible cares about marriages. Uh, when, when it comes to workplace stuff, uh, most everybody's in the workplace, at least for some period of their life, and in the workplace environment. The Bible has so much truth. Here's how this works. Here's how you get along with people. Here's how you do what's right. Here's how you make decisions that honor God in the workplace. And so God's Word covers so much territory. The Word of God is made up of God's Word, and through this book, God exercises authority over life. And the great part, He breathed this life into existence. Nobody knows better how it's supposed to work than God. In, uh, in the book of Hebrews, this guy in Hebrews, he, he's, he's, he's an authority of God's word kind of guy. The book of Hebrews, 86 times he quotes scripture. Now in the New Testament, when they say scripture, they're talking about Old Testament. 86 times, only the books of the Revelation and the Gospel according to Matthew quote the Old Testament more often than the book of Hebrews. And the guy in Hebrews, he's only got 13 chapters to work with. So he showers with his message of God's Word. And as he writes it, he's talking about how, okay, we're on this journey. We're going toward eternity we have this blessed rest in God that awaits us. And, and there's a rest right now that you, you have a sense of peace in your heart because of Jesus in your life. And you can have this, but you can mess it up too. And he uses as an illustration the Israelites, that they got right up to the edge of the promised land, the place of rest, this blessed uh, land flowing with milk and honey. And it's going to be so wonderful. And they got right up to the edge of it, 
and they messed it up by disobeying God, by not putting their faith and trust in God. And so what the writer of Hebrews says is, okay, all those, those Old Testament stories, they're great examples. Sometimes it's things you should do, and sometimes it's things you should not do. Don't do that. Don't do what those people did when they had so much opportunity for blessing just ahead of them, and they, and they let it pass by. And so this is what he writes in Hebrews chapter 4. Let us therefore strive to enter the rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. Don't be like those guys. You have so much opportunity. You're right there at the threshold of such blessing. Don't miss this. Okay, well, how am I going to do that? How do I stay on track? What is my training to make sure I don't mess this up? And he says, the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. How do you do this? The word of God will train you in righteousness. How to stay on the life God intends for you. Now, we, I've said a lot about the Bible. This is a pretty big sweeping things, and I'll, I'll tell you this, though. We don't worship the Bible. We're, it's not a bibliolatry where we have this idol that is the Bible. We worship the God of the Bible. And he has ultimate authority over life. The, the Bible is authoritative because it comes from God. And it's about God. God is our ultimate authority. And the, Ho the Holy Spirit inspired persons to write the Bible... One of my favorite uh, expressions describing the Bible it comes from the Baptist faith and message. And this is what it says about the Bible. It is a perfect treasure of divine instruction. A perfect treasure of divine instruction. It has God as its author, salvation for its end, and truth without any mixture of error for its matter. As such, the Bible becomes for us the revelation, the revealing of God. Now, here's the big question we all have to answer, and we're answering it every day by what we do. And, and it's this, what's going to be the final authority in your life? Like when, when, you, when you come to make a decision about life, about faith, about family, what's the authority that you're going with? Well, this seems like a good idea to me. Well, this is what my friend said. This is what the culture tells me. What are you, how are you making your, your decisions? And we're all standing on some sort of authority. And my challenge to you as we start this series is, are you willing to let God's word be that authority? That, that God has spoken in this book. And will you, will you say, as my default mode, as a follower of Jesus Christ, I'm going to do what this book says first. I want to see what this book says about any decision, any turn in the road, any... Any challenge that I face. And listen, all of us, we have an authority, and sometimes it's going to be God's word. It's going to be the voice of God. And sometimes it's just going to be me. And I feel it when it's just me. And I see the, I see the deficits when it's just me. We're all going to trust something and someone. And at some point, you're just going to make a choice. Am, am I going to believe God's word? And it becomes the whole thing of defining our faith and our relationship to God. Is it going to be God's word or am I just going to make things up and recognize if it's other than God's word, you're just making things up. We talk about cults and the danger of cults. If you're making stuff up, that's what a cult is. We're just making things up. We're making choices about authority every day. The Bible introduces us to faith in Jesus Christ. It, it helps us to move forward well in God-honoring, Christ-reflecting uh, ways through life. And, and it leads us to this wonderful eternity with God. Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount concluded, and he'd said, here's, here's something to think about. Here's what sin looks like. Here's what right relationships look like. Here's how you handle difficulty because you're going to have difficulty in this world. And then he concludes this way. Jesus said, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them, because it's not enough just to hear it. It's replying this to your life. May, may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. 
and the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and slammed against the house, and yet it did not fall, for it had been founded on the rock. We're all building on a foundation. And some people are going to build on a foundation of sand where when the rains come, the floods rise, and everything just washes right out from under you. Or you can build your life on the solid foundation of the Word of God. These words of mine, Jesus said. And, and you can know that when those difficult times come, when the turns in the road come, when, when, you're, when the world around you seems like it's just gone nuts, What's your foundation? And my challenge to you is that you would make the Word of God the foundation for your life. I I wanted to start with this message about the Bible, the beginning of this series, because everything else is going to unravel from here if if you don't get this one right. We, we We have to get to a spot where we say, I really believe this is God talking. And it's not... It's not something I can edit. It's not something I can water down. It's not something I can easily discard. Uh, It's the Word of God. And and I choose to follow this, regardless of what the culture says, regardless of what my peers say, maybe what some members of my own family say. This book is going to be truth for me. And and I challenge you with this. Uh, We talked about this a couple of years ago. Uh, the most popular flavor of ice cream in the world is vanilla. Overwhelmingly. Number two most popular ice cream in the world is chocolate. And it is light years behind vanilla as far as popularity. Number three, four, and beyond, they're way back at chocolate. So if you could only sell one flavor of ice cream in the whole world, what flavor would you sell? You got to sell vanilla. So, somebody say cookies and cream? <laughs> what kind of hard hearts am I dealing with today? Um, you sell vanilla. In study of discipleship, uh, it, was, it was a fairly in-depth, in-depth study about five years ago. They looked at what is the common denominator in spiritual growth across, across different contingencies. From the person who is a spiritual seeker, they don't even... They don't know God. They haven't made a commitment of their life to Christ yet. What helps them to take a step toward Christ? All the way to, you go to Billy Graham or whoever is, you're going to say, this is a really mature person that's really leaning into things in relationship to God. The one common denominator through all this spiritual journey that that was the biggest influencer in spiritual growth and development, it was the Bible. From the non-believer all the way to the very mature, leaning into it Christian the Bible. So if I could just get you to do one thing as a church, if I could just convince you of one spiritual habit to add into your day, it's always going to be the Bible. And, you know, we, Dar Salaam is a heavily Muslim area. You saw the pictures, one of the most Muslim-dominated cities. We'll be passing through there uh, on our way to our location here in the couple of weeks uh, it's, a, it's a tough spot man I'm, I'm glad that they are getting the Bible and they do not have that kind of access in that place and boy that drop off 300,000 plus copies of God's words pretty, pretty amazing story uh, I, have, I have a couple dozen Bibles I dropped my phone on the front front pew but uh I have lots of Bibles on that, on that phone. It is so available, so accessible. I can, I can ride my car and have somebody read my Bible to me from my phone. I don't even have to open the book. I can, it is so available to us. And what if we just made a commitment that we're just going to read it every day? And maybe you could just jump in. We're doing this church-wide Bible reading plan. We want to make it accessible. And if we're all doing it together, maybe we're more likely to hang in there and not give up. And so tomorrow is 2 Timothy chapter 3. And uh, the next day is 2 Timothy chapter 4. And then we're going to read Titus. And then we'll start the the third three-month run in this Bible reading. And why don't you, why don't you jump in with us? If Some of you start in January. And I know now we're in the middle of the year. And... January seems a long time ago, and habits that are pretty consistent can, 
can, can wilt out from under us pretty quick, too. What if you just jump back in and say, I'm going to read a chapter, a chapter from the Bible every day. When uh, you're saying, word of God speak, yeah, I opened my Bible this morning to 2 Timothy chapter 2. And really, with fear and trembling, I opened God's word. Because I expect that Almighty God is about to start talking to me about today. That's what it means to read the Bible. And I want to encourage you. Take this step and start listening to God's Word. Be a part of a Bible fellowship group where you're going to study God's Word together. Get into a women's group or a men's Bible study where you're going to be working into God's Word. But, but you hear it. You read it. You, you digest it. You apply it. And eternal things start to happen. This is the word of God. Let's stand, let's pray.